Hi guys, it's Crystal. I hope you guys are all doing well and that everything is going great for you this week. Um, maybe you're enjoying the sun. I don't know if it's out where you are. Hopefully so. Um, sorry about the irregularity of my postings lately, guys. I've had some technical problems with my internet, but hopefully I'll be able to get a, on a routine soon. If you guys are new to this channel, like I said, my name's Crystal and I do Canadian true crime or true crime with a Canadian twist from time to time. I also do international crimes um, this month, like I've been talking about through recommendations and this case that we're going to be doing in the next two weeks. This is a two parter, guys. Boy, what a case um, is going to be international. There's a, like a tiny link to Canada, but it's mostly international. So if that sounds like something that's good that you guys want to learn about, come on over and join us. Hit that old like button. Hit the subscribe button. Notifications that sometimes work, sometimes don't. I don't know why. <laughs> and leave me a comment. You know, I'm going to say it particularly about this case. I might not get as many comments in the first part as in the second. And if you guys are returning subscribers, you guys already know how much I love you and how thankful I am that you guys choose to join me every week or whenever you can. I'm so thankful for it, guys. If you guys do choose to leave comments, though, you guys already know, no hate, please. There's already enough hate in the world, and we're just here to talk about things. Like I said before, and I have many times, your theories might be different than mine, and I always love to think about other people's theories and see how different they are from mine and how they're good for the case things of that nature it, it's very interesting to me so today's case guys i promised you an international one we're mostly in england today um it's about lord lucan have you guys ever heard of lord Le lucan i had read like um a small max hain novella on this you know how he releases like the true crime books well he doesn't anymore because he's dead but he did release the true crime books based on articles from his um i think he was in nova scotia at the time and he did a lot of canadian true crime so i did know about this case um i didn't realize it was as twisty as it really is so get ready guys so richard john bingham lord lucan the seventh Earl of Lucan, I guess we should say. He was actually born December 18th of 1934. And this would be in Marylebone. I hope I'm saying it right. It looks like Mary Lebone. I'm sorry, guys. You know how I am. Um, that's London in the UK. Uh, he's the oldest son of George Bingaman, who was the sixth Lord of Lucan. And his mother's name was Caitlin Elizabeth Ann Dawson. Um, the family always referred to him as John, so a lot of the times you're going to hear me call him John or Lord Lucan or Lord Bingham, just depended on who he was at that point in time, I guess. So we're going to refer to him as John. At this point in time, he had an older sister as well. Her name is Jane. I'm not quite sure how much older than he is. I don't think it was too much. So Caitlin actually had a blood clot in her lung uh, shortly after she gave birth to Lord Lucan. So he was mostly raised by a nanny. Her name was Lucy Sellers. However, this is fairly common in upper class or aristocratic families in the UK anyway. So I don't think it would be that unusual, but the, it's part of the story. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, like I said, initially he was raised by the nanny and then his mother took over when she could, um, when she was more well. Uh, he does have a younger brother and a younger sister as well. Their names are Hugh and Sally. Uh, when he was three, he started attending a pre-prep school with Jane. Everything was going along as normal until 1939. Of course, then you guys know war was imminent between Germany and England, as well as most other countries at this point in time. And in order to keep the kids safe, Lord and Lady Lucan decided they were going to send the oldest two at this point in time. It was just Jane and John. They sent them to Wales, the island of Wales, because they thought that it would be safer. Uh, Wales is about four hours and 15 minutes away. However, by 1940, with the repeated bombings of London, they also decided to evacuate the younger two children. I don't know if his parents ever went with him. From the sounds of it, guys, his parents actually stayed in London. And it was the four kids that went on. And from uh, Wales, they actually 
is the Canadian link ended up in Toronto. Now there is a couple reports that said they stayed in Toronto for about five years. That appears to be wrong guys. They just stayed there for a short time, but there's your Canadian link. They were in Toronto. And from Toronto, they ended up going to a place called Mount Kisco. And this would be in New York State. And they stayed with a very wealthy family friend. Her name was Marsha Brady Tucker. I'm sorry, I don't mean to laugh, but Marsha Brady. But her name was Marsha Brady Tucker. And they stayed there and she was pretty opulent, guys. They got really used to living a luxurious life. Yes, their parents were wealthy, but Marsha Brady Tucker was really wealthy. And she never said no to the kids. They grew up getting pretty much whatever they asked for. Now, while he was there, he actually attended the Harvey School. And during the summers, he and his siblings would go to summer ca camp in the, God, I have such problems saying this. I'm so sorry, guys, I'm embarrassed. Adrian Dack Mountains, I hope I'm saying it right. Adrian Dack, Adrian Dack. I know how to say the chair. I just, I know what it is. Just have problems saying it. Sorry, guys. They went there and um, went to summer camp in the mountains. So like I said, the kids enjoyed all of this, but of course in 1945, when war seemed like it was very much on the turning point, I think they had sensed that since 1944, by February of 45, his parents decided they wanted the kids back home. So the kids ended up going back to England at that point in time. Now, England was vastly different of course, at this point in time, and their family home in Marylebone had actually been heavily bombed, guys, so they couldn't go back there. They had another home in London, but it also suffered some damage. It appears that all the windows were blown out, so the family couldn't stay there. This was upsetting for the kids, but even more so, they were upset because there was still rationing, and they weren't used to having to ration food or clothing or anything. In the States, it wasn't as bad war-wise, right, because... It was mostly in Europe and the Pacific Rim that war was taking place. So they didn't have to, there was still rationing, but it wasn't as bad as what it would have been in England at that point in time. And the kids were kind of spoiled at this point in time. They were very entitled. So they were upset about the fact that they couldn't live in the opulence that they had become used to. Now, his parents also, I guess, were highly agnostic. I'm not sure what this would have to do with his status at this point, but the reports made mention of it. Not only that, his parents were actually socialist. They believed in equality for all and the wealth split up among the masses. So yeah, they spent money, but they were, they in no way lived the same lifestyle as Marsha Brady Tucker. And that's what the kids were used to. I don't know if all of them were really upset when they got back, but it appears that John was to the point where he suffered nightmares, I guess, and the family had to take him to a psychiatrist. Nightmares about maybe not having as much, I'm not totally sure. But anyway, he suffered nightmares and they took him to a psychiatric hospital, but he didn't, I don't think he stayed there. I think he was just assessed at this point in time. Um, it's also interesting to note that even though, so John's parents were agnostic at this point in time, he wasn't necessarily, I think he used to go to church with Marsha Brady Tucker. He did eventually become agnostic himself, meaning that he didn't believe one way or another guys. He was just whatever, but he did end up making his children go to church because he wanted them to have a quote, traditional childhood, end quote. It's just a little bit of stuff for it there. So, of course, after the war, he attended the very prestigious um, Eton College. You guys know you've heard about it. Royalty goes there. The aristocrats go there. So, of course, John Bingham would have to go there. Um, it was actually while he was in Eton that he started becoming interested in gambling. Mm. It seems like at this point, he wasn't like on the playing side so much because he decided to become a bookmaker. You guys know what a bookmaker is. It's a bookie. So a bookie is someone who, I want to get this exactly right, guys, sets the odds and then the buyer agrees to them. Uh, the bookie goes and accepts the, the bet and he places them as well. And then if that person wins, the bookie is the one that deal, doles out the money. Um, if they lose, 
I think they have other people to, to do that, to do what they need to do for them. But that's what he was doing. He was a bookie and he was making money on it. He used it to supplement his allowance, apparently. But he never, he always hid it apparently in a safe, a secret safe. And he would often leave campus to go to the horse races. That was one of his big deals. He really loved the horse races too. I'm, I'm guessing it's easier to be a bookie with horse races. We learned this a little bit in Ambrose Small, if you guys will remember. So he was not a particularly gifted student by any means. He didn't seem to really care that much about school. It was just a thing that he went to. Um, there was no real distinction for him. Uh, he did end up being, it looks like a head of a fraternity house at one point in time. Um, but regardless, he left school, it appears in 1953, and he left school to um, have a stint in the army. If you guys have watched, most royals and most uh, aristocratic families will serve in the army, and this is what he did too. His father, George Bingham, the sixth Earl of Lucan, actually had also served in the army, and they served in the same regiment of the Coldstream Guards. Now, I don't know if you guys are aware of who the Coldstream Guards were. I wasn't, but I know a little bit more now. It's the oldest continuously serving regiment in, in the British Army, guys. It's one of its regular duties is to perform at ceremonial occasions. So if they were crowning a new queen, um, funerals, uh, state funerals, balls, things like that. It's the cold stream guards that you actually see there. Uh, they're also, they were also involved in every major fight between Britain and whatever other country. They were also involved in that. And one of their major duties is to protect the royals, guys. So John served in this from 1953 to either 54 or 55. I wasn't completely certain on that, but it looks like he only served for about a year. However, like I said, he served in the same regiment as his dad did, and he did actually make second lieutenant. At this point though, John had definitely developed a passion, let's just say, that's how they say it, a passion for gambling. He learned how to play poker when he was in the army and apparently he had, that was his best, I guess that was his best bet for poker. Let's just say he had a great poker face. One of his friends, um, I believe his name is Stuart Wheeler, once said that that's why he was so good at card games and games of chance because he would never let his emotions betray his face. He didn't matter if he was winning or losing, he would always stay poker-faced, stone-faced. So that's what they said about him. That's what made him so good. He never sweat if he was losing or not, or winning or not. He just didn't let people know. He also became highly involved in um, backgammon and the card game bridge. Apparently, he was pretty skilled at this stuff, guys. Um, he won quite a bit, but he also lost quite a bit. I just wanna let you guys know this. But he was very skilled at playing both the games. He was an early member of the Claremont Club uh, in England, which was a highly exclusive club, basically just for rich English gamblers. And it was kind of like a clubhouse, if you will. They would gamble there, but they would also drink and eat there. They spent a lot of time at the Claremont Club. Now the Claremont Club did close down in 2018, actually. So not that long ago, um, but it was very, Let's just say if you had membership, you were definitely one of the wealthier Britons. Uh, in either 54 or 55, once again, there was a little bit of clouding about that, John joined a bank called the William Bandit Son and Company. Uh, sorry, William Brandt, B-R-A-N-D-T-S, and Company. Uh, William Br sorry guys, I'm really having problems. All I can hear is Lola. She's playing with a shoe right now. Um, William Brant's Sons and Company. Now, this is actually uh, a merchant bank, so it deals with uh, commercial businesses, commercial loans, investments, things of that nature. But he actually joined them. Um, he earned approximately £5,000. We're going to be doing this a lot. I'm sorry guys if it gets exhausting. So £5,000 a year 
back then in 54 and 55 is actually worth about 139,776 pounds a year now, which is basically $238,164 Canadian guys. So he was earning quite a bit. It would seem, that seems like a lot to me. So in 54, it was probably 54, 55, it was probably a lot, but he also had the trusts funds that from his family name. In 1960, he met a, met a man named Stephen Raphael. Um, you're going to hear this name again. This is why I'm mentioning it. He was a really rich and very skilled card player too. Very good at backgammon, just like John. And he was also a stockbroker. And the two of them started hanging out quite a bit. They became very, very good friends. And it was during this time, and, and I'm going to say through the influence of Stephen Raphael, that John decided he was a good enough um, card player to go professional, that he could be a professional at this point in time. Now, like I said, it wasn't, he was good, but he was also not the greatest. He was, but he wasn't. You know how gambling goes, guys. Sometimes it's just the luck. And I would say he was becoming more and more addicted at this point in time, but I hesitate to call him a gambling addict at this time because it gets much worse and he did have some fairly heavy losses but of course he still had his salary from the bank and he also had his private trusts and it appears that he used um the private trust money a lot for that guys not so much his own but i'm not totally sure he once actually lost eight thousand pounds which is almost two hundred thousand dollars in today's money in pounds and here in Canada it would be a little bit over three hundred thousand pounds guys he lost that in one night just in one sitting but it didn't seem to matter to him and that that eight thousand pounds was basically two-thirds of the money that he had from his family allowance let's call it every year <laughs> Lola wants to be on tape too Ah, uh, um, at some point in 1960, John decided that he was a good enough professional card player that he could actually just quit his job at the bank. Now, there seemed to be a couple reasons for this. It wasn't just that he thought he was good at that. Number one was that at one point in time, in one night, he won 26,000 pounds. So that's over half a million pounds in today's money and more than a million in, ta in today's Canadian money. So he won that in one sitting. He figured, hey, I'm that good. Look at how much money I just won. I don't need this. But the other reason for it was that apparently one of his co-workers was promoted above him. And I guess he was like a little angry about this. So he figured he was done. And it's around this point in time that he actually learned earned the nickname Lucky Lucan because of the 26,000 or 26,000 pound win. He actually said, quote, why should I work in a bank when I can earn a year's money in one single night at the tables? End quote. That was his justification. So now at this point in time, he's unfettered. He doesn't have a job. So he decided his next best move was to go and tour the U.S. for a while. And that's what he did. He basically lived the playboy lifestyle, just screwing around in the States, um, going to various horse races, playing golf, gambling at the tables. I'm sure Atlantic City saw him. I'm sure Vegas saw him too. And racing his beloved speedboats. He was really into speedboats. And also Aston Martins. So you guys know what an Aston Martin is, right? The Bond car. I'm going to call it the Bond car. That's where you normally see it. It's like smaller, very sporty, but it's a luxury car brand from the UK. Basically, people of status buy it to show they have status. He had one. In fact, it seems like he may have had more than one in his lifetime, but he had one and he liked to show it off to people. Um, they can cost anywhere from $161,000 and up, guys. The starting price is like $161,000. That's a lot of money. Um, he eventually did return to the States. I guess he got, or he eventually did, sorry, return to England. I guess he got bored. I'm not sure. And at this point in time, he's in his late 20s and he finally decides he's going to move out of the familial home. So he decided to get his own apartment at a place called Park Crescent in London, England. Um, 
he was just living his lavish lifestyle. He didn't want to be under his parents' thumb anyway. Not that it mattered. I mean, he was a legal adult, but you know what I mean? He wanted to be free to do whatever he felt like doing. And plus he lived alone when he was in the States. So there you go. In early 1963, so John would have been about 29 at that point in time. Yeah, 29, around about there. John met a woman named Veronica Mary Duncan. Now, Veronica was actually the daughter of a man named Major Charles Morehouse Duncan. And he was a major in World War II. And I think he had quite a bit of um, distinction, guys. That's why they mentioned him. She was actually born May 3rd of 1937. However, in 1939, when she was two, the major actually died in a car accident. And as such, um, Veronica and her family moved to South Africa for a while. It's probably for the best anyway, because the war is starting at this point in time. They did return to England though, um, when Mrs. Duncan got remarried. Veronica was known as a, quote, gifted artist, end quote. She studied art at an art college in Bournemouth. And from there, she then went to live with her older sister, Christina, in London. While she was living there, she worked as a secretary, but she also did some modeling. Um, Christina married a man named William Shand Kidd. I know you guys know this name. Everybody does. His half-brother was actually Peter Shand Kidd. And Peter Shand Kidd is, of course... Princess Diana is the future Princess Diana's stepfather. So it was through that connection, through William and Peter, that Veronica and Christina entered into London's high up social life, that they became socialites, if you will. He was their invitation. And it was actually during one of these high up social functions at a golf club, I think a golf tournament, I believe it was, that she met John and he basically swept her off her feet. The two dated and were married within a hot minute, guys. I think it was just a few months because they met in 63 and they were married by November 20th of 1963. And in fact, Veronica, it's been said that Veronica stated before she was married that, quote, she was looking for a God and he was a dream figure, end quote. So he checked all her boxes. Actually, just give me one second, guys. I'll, I'll see if I can pull up a picture of their wedding so that that way you guys know who we're talking about. Sorry, guys. So like I said, they only dated for pretty much a hot minute. I want to say it was like a month, guys. It might have been two. It really wasn't very long. But they did seem to be happy enough. They seemed to get along quite well. And at this point in time, everything was working out for them. Ah, there we go. Sorry, guys. So there you go, if you want to see it. That's Lord Lucan and that's Veronica. John and Veronica. So of course, like everybody, the only, actually the only royal that was in attendance at their wedding was Princess Alice. Now a lot of the times aristocratic, especially if they have connections to the throne, and obviously John would because he's a lord, a lot of the times, um, many royals will come out to the wedding. But at this point in time, apparently only Princess Alice did. They then honeymooned around Europe, you know, sightseeing and doing their things. Now, when we say honeymoon, we're thinking like a week, right? No, 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 no. They were gone for months. That's just how it was. Uh, Veronica was unaware of Lord Bigham's, of John Bigham's finances at this point in time. He, he was really good with keeping that stuff secret, let's just say. Uh, he was living a high lifestyle. He was showing around, of course, vacationing in European. He's got the car. He's got the speedboats. He's got everything. So at this point in time, she, she was completely unaware. Um, and of course, she didn't have to worry at this point in time either. Uh, his losses were becoming heavier 
but she she didn't know. I'm going to guess that he dealt with most of the finances for the family anyway, guys. Uh, so because he was struggling so much, when he got back from his European honeymoon, he went to his father and the sixth Lord Lucan uh, actually gifted his son a sum of money. Uh, this was so that Lord Lucan could buy a large family home. Um, I guess they must have wanted several children, guys. And this was so that he could buy a family home for that extent. Uh, he did actually use the money to pay off some debts. So I guess he did that. But he also used it to buy a home at 46 Lower Belgrade Street in Belgravia. Now, Belgravia is a really affluent district in London, guys. It's in central London. Um, the city of Westminster is within this district. And so are areas of Kensington and Chelsea. So very affluent, guys. Um, it's a pretty quiet place to live, I guess, though, too. And it's located in the center of London, so it's a pretty hot commodity. However, most of the houses, and that's now, guys, most of the houses for sale in there are astronomically priced. They are some of the most expensive homes in the world in this area. And, of course, this is where John had to sell. He still has that thing, that thing from childhood, like he's losing out. That's, that's the main gist of what I get from this. He always feels like because of the way he lived part of his childhood, he should have more money than he does. It always feels like he seems to think he needs to have this affluent lifestyle because he's a lord and he does have money, but he has to show it off. It just, it's almost like, he went from indulgence to what he would view as deprivation. We wouldn't, but he would. So he was continuously trying to build up his fortunes. And let's just say he thought that gambling was a way he could do it instead of an honest job. Um, so they moved there in about 1967, it would appear. And of course, it was decorated to Veronica's taste. I don't think he really cared about the house itself. He just what it looked like on the inside he was more for status on the outside so on january 21st of 1964 george bingham the sixth lord of lucan actually died of a stroke and because of this lord lucan inherited all of his titles being the oldest son he would um his titles now became the seventh lord of lucan he was also the earl of lucan the baron lucan of castlebar baron lucan of melcombe and the Baronet Bingham of Castlebar. And because of this, um, his wife became Lady Lucan. But Veronica also became the Countess of Lucan. So the couple went on to have three kids. The first was Lady Frances. And she was born October 4th of 1964. Then they had a son named um, Lord George Bingham. He was born September 21st of 1967. And they had a young daughter, their youngest daughter, sorry, was called Lady Camilla Bingham. And she was born June 30th of 1970. So as with the tra tradition of aristocracy, but also probably because um, Lucan himself was raised by the nanny, remember the blood clot. Um, the couple immediately hired a nanny to help them out with the children. Now, it does seem that with their first child, at least for sure, Lord Lucan had an interest in her or or was loving to her. Um, he tried to get her to share his interests, you know, so they'd have something in common. Uh, particularly, he tried to get her into gambling. She was only like three, but he tried to get her into gambling, you know, the traditional masculine things like shooting and um, racing, horses, things like that, um, fishing, golf, but she never had an interest in that stuff. I don't know if he ever tried to show it to George, but he did try to show his daughter. Now, at this point in time, Lucan had a fairly regular routine. Early on in their marriage, when they had kids, he had a fairly regular routine. He'd be up at about 9.30 and he'd eat well I should say he'd be up at about nine and he'd eat his breakfast and go over his business matters whatever they might have been then he would have coffee 
Um, he would deal with anything that had to be dealt with. He seems to have done this in the early morning. He would read his papers, things of that nature. Now, sometimes he'd go for a jog in the park after this, and sometimes, or sometimes he'd take the dog for walks. However, he would then venture out to his customary spot at the Claremont Club in the afternoon, and he'd start gambling then. Um, they'd gamble for a little while until the card game petered out. He would go home, change his clothes, and be back at the Claremont Club for dinner and more gambling later on that night. And he would gamble sometimes into the wee hours of the morning, guys, just depending on how good his luck was, I guess. And it was kind of expected that Veronica would go and watch him. Never take part, but, you know, cheer her husband on, I guess, silently. Um, now Lord Lucan has been described and you guys have seen his picture as really shy and reserved. You wouldn't think he was popular, but he actually was a fairly popular guy, um, with his friends. He was tall. He was thin. He had what people described as a quote, luxuriant guardsman mustache, but he was a man's man. And that's why he had so many friends. He enjoyed all the traditional masculine things in the culture. He enjoyed hunting. He enjoyed gambling. He enjoyed fishing. He enjoyed shooting. He enjoyed golf, things of that nature. And because of this, he amassed a great deal of friends. He was very much accepted into the aristocracy and people liked him. He was very profoundly traditional though. I just want you guys to know that, but he also had this deep love of money and, you know, an aristocracy, most of them love money. Um, at one point in time, he actually said, and this seems like it was about 1956, and this will go with the theme I described before with him and money. He actually said that he needed, quote, at least two million pounds in the bank um, for things like motor cars, yachts, expensive holidays, and security for the future would give myself and a lot of other people a lot of pleasure, end quote. So he's very driven by pleasure, guys. He's hedonistic. And he was fairly generous, uh, especially with his friends. And it didn't appear that he was above buying his friends, guys. Um, whenever he took them out, he'd show them a good time. Hiring helicopters um, so that they could go from place to place. Uh, and planes. They actually said private airplanes so that he could transport his friends in luxury to whatever area. Of course doing the racing boat thing, the Aston Martin, taking them uh, to horse races, gambling hunts, things of that nature. He wasn't above spending money on people and he wasn't above buying people. Um, he also, of course, you know, loved the greater things in life. He drank super expensive Russian vodka, which would have been really hard to have get at that point in time. Um, he also, of course, raced his expensive boats and had to have the Aston Martin. So he loved the lifestyle. In 1966, this is really funny, actually. Lucan screen tested for a part in a movie called Woman Time 7. Now, he didn't get that part. But <clears throat> let's just say that a director for the James Bond movies actually saw the screen test and kind of urged Lord <laughs> Lucan to screen test for the role of James Bond, which he would have been perfect for, right? He already loves the Aston Martins, dark hair, luxurious, elegant, um, aristocratic, high society guy, suave, all that stuff. He would have been perfect for it. And they really wanted him to test, but because he hadn't, gotten apart from his last screen test, he actually rejected being James Bond. He rejected it. Could have been because he was afraid he really wasn't good. It could have been because they turned him down once, so we just didn't care anymore. But he actually did screen test for a movie. So at this point in time, though, it was pretty evident by the late 60s that he was super addicted to gambling. And at this point in time, his losses were starting to really exceed his wins. He was considered one of the top backgammon players, the top 10 backgammon players in the world. I guess he won at the St. Um, James Club, which seems to be a fairly affluent club. All I could see was tennis, guys. I didn't see a lot about backgammon. 
but um, he was one of the top 10 players for that. And he was, he actually won um, on the West Coast of the US. He was, um, sorry, he was the champion of the West Coast of America. That's exactly what they called him. So he was good. It's just, he tended to go overboard, let's just say. In 1968, he decided to try his hands at actually owning a horse race. He wanted to own thoroughbreds and race them himself. However, this didn't seem to work out for him, and he actually spent more money on racing entry fees than winning anything. So this failed. He wasn't good at that. Now, Veronica, like I said before, didn't appear to notice how bad their finances were. Um, the couple would apparently argue about money from time to time, but I don't think she had any idea how bad it really was. I don't think at this point in time it was terrible. Like, he still had money from the trusts, but he also was taking out debts, let's just say. Uh, their relationship was kind of rocky due to the finances, but also due to the fact that she was super lonely. Lord Lucan was never home. He was always at the club. You know, if she went there, she was expected to stay silent and just be there for support. They didn't really spend any time together. And when he was home, he didn't really pay attention to how the home was run. At this point in time, it doesn't seem like he really paid a lot of attention to the kids either, but I can't say for sure. She was very, very lonely. Um, this was compounded by the fact that she apparently suffered, suffered from postnatal depression with the last two children, with um, George and Camilla. She suffered from some postnatal depression, guys. Um, at this point, Lord Lucan decided he was going to become more involved in her mental health treatment. I guess he took a vested interest in it. And in 1971, he actually took her to be treated for long, for lasting depression exacerbated by her loneliness. He actually took her to a clinic in Hampstead. However, she refused to be admitted. She didn't appear to be as depressed as what he was saying. He was letting people believe that she was much worse off than she was. And so she refused to be admitted. However, she did agree to having a psychiatrist come by the house once a week. I believe it was once a week. And also to taking antidepressants in order to make herself feel better. Now, according to one source, and this was only one source, so I can't confirm it. Another reason for her depression was because she started what was called a, quote, platonic affair, end quote leads me to believe it was more of an emotional affair with a man that she met. Uh, doesn't, doesn't seem like there was anything sexual involved with it. It was just an emotional affair. And Lord Lucan actually found out about it. For some reason, this made him angry, probably because of the scandal, right? They're, arist they're aristocratic. So if there was a scandal, it would look negative. So he actually confronted this guy and apparently scared him off. Uh, but because this guy, this outlet for her was gone, she went into a deep depression. And that's another reason why she ended up suffering from depression. In July of 1972, the family vacationed at Monte Carlo. You guys know it's, it's the natural hotbed for gambling, guys, for affluent people, the playground of the rich and famous, particularly people who love to gamble. So, of course, they went to Monte Carlo. Uh, didn't appear to do anything for them family-wise because Lady Lucan and Camilla, who was about two at this time, actually ended up leaving really early. So, the relationship deteriorated even more. And by Christmas of 1972, it was over. They decided to separate. His gambling mixed with their finances, mixed with her mental health issues, but... These were his more projected, the fact that he thought it was worse than it was or he was telling people it was worse than it was, actually led to the downfall. Now, Lucan moved out of their property at 46 Lower Belgrade, 
Street, and he then moved to a property on Eaton Row that was pretty close by before finally settling into an apartment on Elizabeth Street. Elizabeth Street is about three minutes away from their former residence. You know, you can keep a watch that way. Apparently, Veronica did try to reconcile with her husband, but Lord Lucan was over it. He was over the marriage. He was over everything. Uh, and at this point in time, his main focus, seems like his only focus, was on getting custody of his children. I don't know why it appeared to be so important to him. He Maybe he really was worried about her mental health. Seems more like he could have possibly viewed the kids as his property or because he was an aristocrat. He actually was. She wasn't so much before they married. Maybe he thought he could provide for them better or that it would make him look better in his standing if he had the kids. Of course, maybe he really did love them. I'm, I'm sure he did, but maybe he really did want to be close to him. But at this point, his main focus and what people would later be called an obsession became on getting his kids back. Uh, he actually decided that he would have them no matter what. And at this point in time, the custody battle was pretty vicious. Uh, he wanted to prove that Veronica was unfit due to her mental illness. So he decided to employ any means necessary, let's just say. He actually decided to start spying on his family to get evidence and neighbors and people could recall often seeing his car or himself on Lower Belgrade Street just watching. Uh, eventually, he actually hired a private investigator to do this for him. So, you know, people wouldn't talk and say, oh, I saw you down there, right? And assume that he couldn't get over things. It was more he just wanted the kids. It didn't have anything to do with him wanting his wife back. He just wanted the kids. He also apparently talked to several doctors, psychiatrists, trying to get Lady Lucan committed um, because he told them that she had, quote, gone mad, end quote. However, the doctors didn't agree with this. Um, Lady Lucan wasn't mad, like John claimed. She wasn't suffering from an untreatable mental illness or an untreated mental illness. Yes, depression is a mental illness, guys, but hers was on the lower end of the spectrum. And though the courts, or sorry, those psychiatrists believed that, yeah, antidepressants would help her, in no way did she need a hospital stay. She wasn't a danger to herself. She wasn't a danger to her kids. They said she didn't need it. At this point, the family was also going through nannies at a steady rate. And part of the reason is because Lord Lucan would try to befriend the nannies so he could pump them for information about his wife. Um, <coughs> now, the original nanny, Lillian uh, Jenkins, who they had hired when Francis was born, Lady Lucan actually let go of in December of 1972. And I believe it was because of her loyalty to John to Lord Lucan. Um, Lucan would then go around and as part of his deal, he would go around telling people that Veronica couldn't keep nannies because nobody wanted to work for her. Um, but like I said, it was doing his part to me his meddling too, like taking them out to for drinks or dinners and stuff to try to pump them for information. That's very uncomfortable. Um, one nanny named Stefania Sawicka said that Veronica had actually told her in confidence that Lord Lucan used to abuse her, particularly that he would beat her with a cane. He told Veronica he was beating her with this cane in order to, quote, beat the madness out, end quote. Um, he, she also said that he had tried to push her down the stairs on at least one occasion, and apparently she told Stefania that she was afraid of Lord Lucan and that she wouldn't be surprised if Lord Lucan killed her one day. So he was abusive. I don't know if that's something that a lot of people knew, but she did later interviews in Life, guys. Be, and uh, she did later on, 
when she was talking about her marriage, she definitely alleged that he abused her. So I'm, I'm pretty sure he was abusive. Uh, but like I said, I can't confirm this. Now, apparently, once again, I can't confirm this. Lucan might have actually gotten off on beating her, I guess, to say it a nice way. Uh, maybe he had an interest in s and I'm not quite sure. Um, but apparently, when he beat her... Lady Lucan said, quote, they were measured blows. He must have gotten pleasure out of it because he had intercourse with me afterwards, end quote. Um, and this was actually in an ITV documentary from not that long ago, guys. Apparently, there was a sexual element to his, his abuse for him. Uh, in late March of 1973, Lucan... And two private investigators actually came up to Stefania uh, Sawicka and the younger two children. I believe they were at a park near the family home. Francis was in school at this time. And told the nanny that the kids were now wards of the state. Very, very strange. I guess he wasn't above lying. They were wards of the state that I know of. There were no papers that said that but anyway and she had to turn them over to him immediately which is also strange because if they were wards of the state a state um, official would have come and collected the kids but regardless and of course because she heard this she turned the kids over to him he also went to school and picked up Francis giving them the same deal now at this point in time they weren't wards of the state but he had somehow managed to get temporary custody of the kids. I'm not quite sure how, but he had some has somehow managed to do it. So at this point in time, he has temporary custody of the kids. Um, Veronica, of course, went to the courts and asked for the children to be immediately returned. Now, the judge sensed that this was going to be a highly charged and, and controversial or conflict-filled matter. So he decided to adjourn it until June 3rd of 1973. And there they would make a decision on who uh, should have custody of the children. So, of course, Lucan, as his defense, is claiming that Veronica is crazy. In order to support her defense that she wasn't, she decided to actually go and be assessed once again at a clinic. And this was the Priori Clinic in Roehampton. She went there for a four-day stay to be properly assessed so she could definitely say, hey, no, guys, I've got this paper. Definitely not insane. Um, which is really bothering me, guys, because that's the terms they would have used then was crazy and madness and insane. These are not my terms, guys. These are terms from the research and from the times. Um, I'm just putting it into context for you. Depression is a serious mental illness. Um, but like I said before, she was not on the higher end of it. She, it appears that counseling and, and uh, antidepressants helped her. She was desperate for the kids and she would basically do anything to be able to have her kids. So she went all the way with this assessment. Now the clinic did fa find that she could benefit from counseling from some, um, going to a psychiatrist and antidepressants, but in no way was she a danger to herself, to society. She in no way needed to stay at the clinic. She was just suffering from mild to moderate depression and anxiety. They also believe she had anxiety too. Um, now, of course, they went before the judge and the judge was really upset with the way Lucan had dealt with things, you know, the spying and the private investors and the underhanded or the private investigators and the underhandedness. So Lucan actually found himself having to account for what he had done to his wife and why he was, you know, kind of torturing her. He had to account for all that. Eventually, Lucan had to concede the case. His lawyers actually told him to. 
He really didn't have a defense. She's not unfit. She was never an unfit mother and she was not mentally ill. So as such, she could clearly care for the kids and they were awarded to her with Lucan. And plus he did some pretty underhanded things. I don't think that necessarily bode well for him in the custody dispute. So at this point in time, Veronica has custody of the kids and Lord Lucan can see them every other weekend. So the custody dispute, even though it's over, even though a judge has already, has already adjudicated on it, it became even more bitter. John was trying to make his friends and family side with him and their mutual friends and family. And they did actually, most of them sided with John, including Veronica's own sister, Christina. I guess money can buy everything, guys. I, I don't know what it is, if it was just his status, if it was the fact that Christina was also aristocratic due to being married to William Shan Kidd and they, were, they went in the same circles. I don't know why, but she sided with him. John started recording the phone conversations that he'd have with Veronica. In addition to, of course, still watching her. And he would play these tapes for anybody that would listen to them. He didn't care who it was. He'd just play the tapes. It was almost like he was trying to ask them if they were hearing anything unfit. He was still trying to prove her unfit, guys. He was still definitely trying to do that. He told his friends... And the manager of the bank, where I believe they would have had the account, like his accounts would have been set up, but she probably would have had access to them what with the fact that they were married. He actually told the manager from the bank and several of his friends that Veronica went through money like water, that she was the one blowing through the money in the accounts. And he essentially, from what I gather, locked her out of the accounts. He delayed payment to the nanny service, to the milkman, and allegedly he delayed payment to their food service from Harrods. They're high class people. Of course, they got food service from Harrods. But he apparently, not necessarily didn't pay, but he would delay payments. And of course, this makes things really, really hard. Number one, Veronica was actually forced by the courts to employ a nanny. That was one of the mandates from the courts was that she must employ a nanny. And he's wreaking havoc by making payments late and erratic. Therefore, the nanny service doesn't quite trust that they're going to be paid. So there's another reason why they went through a lot of nannies as well. Um, it, it made it very hard. And nannies like childcare, right? You have to pay a certain amount on a certain time. These payments are being delayed. Nobody's getting paid. It's causing a lot of anger. So as such, Lady Lucan actually took on a part-time job in order to help supplement this and be able to pay for these things. Apparently, the courts had set her allowance, basically her alimony from Lord Lucan at about $40 a week. And this is approximately, it's a little bit over a thousand dollars or a thousand pounds in today's money and would be basically $1,800 in today's money in Canadian guys. So it seems like a lot, but you have to think she's caring for the three kids. They do have a certain lifestyle and that's what was agreed upon. The courts understand that and he's got money or he appears to have money, he claims to have money. So that's what it was set on. So a nanny named Elizabeth Murphy was hired temporarily and a Lucan immediately befriended her in order to pump her for information on his estranged wife. He then employed his private investigators to dig up information on Elizabeth, uh, I guess to prove that she was unfit and in order to further prove that Veronica was unfit. Anyway, they started checking out Elizabeth. Um, I don't actually know what they found out about her. I don't know if even Lord Lucan did because the private investigators presented him a bill for several hundred pounds and he just decided to fire them. So they were gone. Christabel Martin was the next nanny and she attested to hearing strange phone calls. Um, sometimes the person on the other hand would just do the creepy, heavy breathing. Sometimes a man would ask for just random people, just random names. 
That's all she said, but she did say there was some disturbing phone calls. So he's basically prank phone calling his own home, but whatever. Um, she was, of course, gone shortly afterward, and there were several more rotating nannies until late 1974 when a woman named Sandra Rivette, or Rive, but it's Rivette, R-I-V-E-T-T, -T, decided to take the job. So at this point, Lord Lucan is in some, some definite financial trouble. The court case cost him 20,000 pounds. So in today's money, that's almost 200,000 pounds. And he would have been the one that would have had to pay for everything. Um, that's basically 330,000 pounds Canadian, or $30,000 Canadian, guys. Just think about that. That's how much court cost him. 20,000 pounds back in the early 70s was quite a lot. And it cost him quite a lot. And as such, in late 1974, his reserves, his cash reserves, were pretty much gone. He started, his friends remember at this point in time, he started drinking heavily and smoking heavily, or heavily, two things he hadn't really done before. And his friends grew pretty alarmed. They were, they were pretty scared of what was going on with him. He also started making drunken phone calls to people. Uh, we've heard about this before. Mm, if you guys remember Sherry Furtuck, Greg Furtuck did this. Um, he would make uh, phone calls to his friend. Her name is Lady Mary Osborne Aspinall. I just want you to remember the last name Aspinall. It's going to come up again. Not in this one, but it will. Uh, he also made calls to her son, John Aspinall. He was an infamous bookie, guys, and also the owner of a zoo in London. You're going to hear about the zoo again. So he would call um, several other of his, you know, aristocratic friends and also a guy named Grenville Howard. He would call all of these people and he would actually talk about killing Veronica. How much easier his life would be if Veronica was dead. Grenville, or Grenville Howard later told police in a statement that Lucan talked about murdering Veronica and how doing this, if he murdered her himself, would save him from bankruptcy. He wouldn't, I guess, have to give her an allowance. Maybe if he didn't gamble so much. But anyway, he said that if he murdered her, it would save him from bankruptcy. He talked about ways that he could get rid of the body, uh, specifically dumping her body in a place called the Solent. Um, this is like a, a waterway between the Isle of Wight and uh, Great Britain. He wanted to dump her body there. He said that if he did it this way, he would, quote, never be, qu be caught, end quote. Uh, John then borrowed about 4,000 pounds. I'm sorry, guys. I know I'm making it tough because I keep calculating it. But he ordered, he borrowed about 4,000 pounds from his mother, which is basically close to 39,000 pounds today. And then he asked another friend for one, or for 100,000 pounds. And this was actually Marsha Brady Tucker. He asked Marsha Brady Tucker if he could borrow a a hundred thousand pounds from him from her she said no actually so he then wrote to her son telling him he needed the money to quote buy his kids back end quote but the son also refused he then went on to ask many of his friends and acquaintances for money and nobody would do it I think they're all on to the fact that he's gambling it away. And this was his deal, right? He figured if I can get some, if I can get this money, I can quickly make it up at the tables and then some. That's that's the gambler's way of thinking, right? I, I, I always have the chance to make it up, even though he was losing quite a bit at this point in time. Um, That's basically what he told them for was, it was for his gambling addiction so he could make fast cash at the tables. Uh, he then, went to a guy named James Goldsmith, who, who is a friend of his. He was a financier, a tycoon, and a politician. James didn't outright loan the money to him. Instead, he guaranteed a $5,000 pound overdraft for him. Um, 
However, this remained unpaid. He was basically a co-signer, guys. It remained unpaid, though. You never paid that back. So Lucan needed even more money, I guess? Trust me, he has things in mind. This is probably why he needed it. So he then applied uh, for a loan at a place called Edgeware Trust. And, of course, he wanted the £5,000. Um... He told them that he earned approximately £12,000, uh, which is close to £116,000 today, from his various family trusts. He's basically telling them that if they loan him the £5,000, they're assured to get it back because he makes more than that in a year. However, he was unable to find a surety, okay, that would help him secure the $5,000 um, uh, loan. So they only load, loaned him 3,000 pounds. It appears he needed a co-signer and he couldn't quite find one. James Goldsmith had already co-signed for his overdraft, but he couldn't find anybody to co-sign for the Edgeware Trust. Not, not somebody who would put up enough collateral or take enough of the risk. So they only loaned him 3,000 pounds. That's what he was guaranteed for, I guess. Um, Edgeware Trust later found out that all four of um, Lord Lucan's accounts, that they knew of anyway, all four of his accounts were thousands of pounds overdrawn at this point in time. His gambling is seriously out of control. But he'd tell people he played for lower stakes, so it was fine. Didn't matter. He was still losing. He was losing a lot. And part of it could have been because mentally he still had this obsession with his kids and that was all that was on his mind. Maybe he couldn't focus as well. It's an addiction though, guys. It drags you under. Um, it was said that between the month of September 1974 and October 1974, he lost, get ready for it, guys. He lost 50 thousand pounds in a month in 1974 dollars this is approximate to almost half a million pounds in today's money or about eight hundred and twenty six thousand dollars in canadian money that in a month he lost that guys so three nights before the incident you know there's going to be an incident three nights before we get into this incident lucan was able to get a close friend i'm not sure who it is uh to loan him 3,000 pounds. It's alleged that at this point, uh, Lord Lucan actually was 60,000 pounds in debt, that that's how much he actually owed people. Uh, some, some reports said 60 to $75,000 in debt. So he's owing close to a million guys. He's got nothing left in his coffers. What he does have left is, is not enough to pay off these debts. And he's feeling a lot of stress, feeling a lot of heat, angry about the fact that he doesn't have his kids. I think it was more or less to prove that he was better than her. And the courts didn't see it that way. Angry that his ex-wife is costing him money anyway, right? He's got to pay, it's either alimony or child support, it's a form of that. He's angry about all this. He still find, wants to find any way he can to basically destroy her, it looks like, too. So he's very angry. He's volatile. He's not in a good state. Um, during this short period, though, during this, this month, guys, friends do remember that it actually seemed like he was getting better and that his obsession was waning, if you will. Now, this is what a lot of people do before they commit really bad crimes but it's also what a lot of people do before they commit suicide or attempt to commit suicide it seems like there's a change in them almost because they know there's going to be relief from the situation as it were um you guys might think of it as a different way but it's almost like they don't care anymore because they have a solution whatever it might be to their problem so the problem isn't weighing on them as much regardless um, like I said, they claimed that the obsession with the kids was waning and it's possible though, that his friends, the aristocratic friends, because they had loyalty to him, were just sticking up for him. But regardless, they say that he was getting better. Um, uh, apparently at his requisite family dinners too, right? He still had, um, dinners with his mom and his siblings. 
uh, they also said that he was talking a lot less about getting the kids back than he had in the previous two years. On November 6th of 1974, Lord Lucan saw several friends and family members. None of them recall, or will at least admit to it anyway, any strange or unusual behavior from Lord Lucan. Um, one even said, quote, he seemed very happy, just his usual self, and there was nothing to suggest that he was worried or depressed, end quote. Lucan's schedule had changed since since the separation, but it kind of seems like it changed since, since he'd started gambling even more and more, let's just say. Um, he, because he often gambled into the wee hours of the night, he wouldn't often get up until noon. Noon was usually when he woke up, guys. I don't even know if he attended to business anymore or anything else. It just seems like he woke up, he got dressed and he went to the club. Uh, he also would take sleeping aids too. I guess he said he had insomnia. That could have been due to the, um, the nightmares he had as a kid. I don't know. But he said he had insomnia. So it, most days, pretty much every day, he wasn't up until around noon. However, this routine, which was established, was changed November 7th of 1974. He got up really early and he called his lawyer. Uh, I don't know what for, but he did call his lawyer that morning. He then made plans at the Claremont Club for what appears to be a late lunch with a woman named Andrina Colquhoun. I hope I'm saying it right. Sorry, guys. Uh, but he actually stood her up. He never ended up showing to that. He also was supposed to, at 1 p.m., meet with um, an artist friend of his and a banker friend of his, also at the Claremont Club, but he stood them up too. He didn't go to that. So in the afternoon, until about 4 o'clock, can't be certain of what he was doing. At about 4.45, no, at about 4 p.m., sorry guys, at about 4 p.m., he called a pharmacy near Victoria's home, asking them to identify a small pill he'd found. They actually told him it was an antidepressant named Limbitrol. They were not surprised he had done this because apparently since the separation, Lord Lucan had called them on several occasions asking them to identify a pill. It appears he's taking these pills from the family home. Either that or he's getting them somehow and trying to prove that Lady Lucan was taking more severe antidepressants or that she was on some type of hard drug, you know, so that he could get the kids back. Regardless, he asked them to identify this pill. They told him what it was, but he would never ever tell them where he found this pill or why he had it. He wouldn't say anything like that. He'd just for, ask for an ID. At 4.45, he called his friend Michael Hicks Beach. Uh, they met at his apartment between 6.30, uh, Lord Lucan's apartment, between 6.30 and 7. Lucan told Michael that he needed help writing. I don't, he's never written anything before, so it's really strange to me. But Michael was a literary agent, and he told Michael that he needed help writing an article about gambling for an Oxford University magazine. He's never had an interest in this before. It's very strange, but anyway. <laughs> he then drove Michael home at eight o'clock. Now, the reason why Michael remembers this so well is because Lord Lucan wasn't driving his usual car. At this point in time, he was driving a Mercedes-Benz, still a luxury car. He wasn't driving it. He was driving a, quote, scruffy Ford, end quote. More than likely a Corsair, that's what Michael believed, that he had apparently borrowed from friends of his a week earlier. He never gave a reason why, he just borrowed it. At 8.30, he then called the Claremont once again to check on reservations that he had for a late dinner, an 11 o'clock p.m. dinner with some friends. It was supposed to be at 11 o'clock and they confirmed it. He, of course, did not show to this dinner. He hadn't showed to any of the appointments he'd made or any of the dates, let's just say, he'd made at the Claremont that day. He did call, though, so they did hear his voice. They did know he was around at that point in time. Um, but, of course, he never 
went to this. He stood these people up too. And also, he stopped answering his phone. So now we're going to have to switch over to Sandra Rabat, guys. You knew she was going to come up again. Sandra Eleanor Rabat was actually born September 16th of 1945. Her family relocated to Australia shortly after that uh, in 1947 when she was about two, but they eventually came back to England in 1955. Um, she was very pretty and very popular, guys. She was described also as being a very smart girl, uh, though she didn't do well in school. It, it looks like she didn't do as well on tests. And you know what? That happens with a lot of people. I've known very, very smart people who don't do well on tests because they're just not good at taking tests. Um, she didn't, um, after she left school, she was aimless, guys. She, she always appeared to be trying to find her way in life and trying to find what best suited her. Um, she decided to try her hand first at being, apprentice, uh, at being an apprentice hairdresser. That didn't work out. About six months later, she was working at a secretary. Um, she was dating a man. It seems like she was very, she very much cared for him, but when the relationship soured or broke off, she did go and stay at a mental health facility for a little while. It appears that she suffered from depression for that. Um, at one point, she then became engaged to a man named John. And at this point in time, she was trying her hand at being a nanny. This was her first stint as being a nanny. And she worked in Croydon for a doctor's family. On March 13th of 1964, she actually gave birth to a son she named Stephen. Um, she wasn't married at the time. You guys know what it was like in the early 60s. Um, and she was still struggling. Uh, she didn't have a lot of money and she was still trying to, to find a job that was a good fit for her. As such, in May of 1965, she actually gave up custody of her son to her parents and they adopted him. Sandra then moved on to working at an old age home and then from there relocated to Portsmouth and lived with her older sister. It was there that she met a sailor um, and his name was uh, Roger Rivette. He also seems to change jobs quite a bit because he was a sailor and then he later worked for the British Road Service and also Esso. So it it seems like she's a free spirit and not quite settled down, but because she's looking for, for the right fit for her. Um, the two of them did marry. They got married on June the 10th of 1967. And like I said, Sandra and Roger continued to change jobs throughout their relationship. By 1973, she added working in an orphanage and at a cigarette company to her resume. Uh, by 1974, though, her marriage to John or to Roger was pretty much over. Um, this seems to be in part due to the fact that Roger was constantly suspicious that she was up to no good when he wasn't home. It, it seems like he was jealous and, and was always thinking that she was having affairs. Um, and as such, Sandra decided to leave him. She started working for a Belgravia domestic agency. Um, and at first she was looking after an elderly couple. But after that, she became employed by Lady Lucan as a nanny. So on November 7th of 1974, there was a change in Sandra's routine as well. She seems to be fairly routine at this point in time. Normally, she and her, this was a Thursday, guys. Normally, she and her boyfriend, a guy named John Hankins, would go out on Thursday nights. That was a regular date night. However, um, a conflict had arose, I guess, maybe for him. And they decided that they went, would go out the night of the 6th instead. She wasn't even supposed to be home this night. I want you guys to keep that in mind. Sandra Rivette was not supposed to be home on November 7th. She just happened to be because of a fluke occurrence and it would cost her guys, it would cost her dearly. 
Um, she spoke with John though that night. She did speak with him on the phone at about eight o'clock. Uh, this is John Hankins. And from there, she put the younger two children to bed. Um, Frances stayed up later because she was older. At 8.55, she asked Veronica if Veronica wanted a, couple, a cup of tea and Veronica said, sure. So at this point in time, Sandra Rivette went to the downstairs kitchen in order to make it. As soon as she entered the basement, because the downstairs kitchen was in the basement, she was a brutally attacked. Um, he, the attacker, beat her to death with a bandaged um, lead pipe. So basically, guys, it means usually that one end of the lead pipe is wrapped for better grip, right? It'd be wrapped in some type of cloth or tape for grip. Sometimes the whole tool is wrapped that way for grip, but they said bandage, so I, I'm gonna assume it was the end of it. Anyway, she was beaten mercilessly with this lead pipe. Interesting, right? She wasn't supposed to be home. But as soon as she went downstairs, beaten to death. Her body was then stuffed in a canvas mailbag. Regardless. So Veronica is starting to wonder where her cup of tea is, what's taking Sandra so long. She Maybe she thought that um, Sandra was having trouble with something. So she decided she was going to go to the basement and look. As soon as she hit the top of the steps for the basement, she was also attacked. And that's where we're going to leave it for today. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I know it's getting exciting. There was a lot of a backstory in this one. Um, next week, it gets even crazier. So stay tuned. I'm going to ask you, even though I know you probably already know, who do you think attacked, uh, well, killed Sandra Rivette and attacked Lady Lucan? Who do you think did it? Why? Why stuff her in a canvas mailbag? What was the point of that? That's just a question I wonder about. I, I, there's no definitive answer. I just wonder why. What do you guys think so far? I'm sure, I'm sure you guys know what I'm getting to, but this is a really crazy story. So I hope you guys have a good rest of the week. Think about this story. Think about <laughs> who you think did it and let me know down below. Um, hopefully I will be more routines next week, guys, but bye for now. I will see you later.